Hello, everyone, and welcome to this joint ENETS Inca educational webinar uh, on today, November 10th, which is Net Cancer Day, being recognized across the across the world with multiple events. And um, we're delighted to be able to have you all join us for this event, which is going to be really targeted at patients and giving you information about neuroendocrine cancer. Uh, I am Mark McDonald. I'm the president of Inca uh, and also chair of Net Patient Network in Ireland. I'm also a patient. Yes, and you can take the next slide, please. So, hello everyone. From my side as well, my name is Eva Tienz Jansson. I'm the chair of INETS, and I'm really happy that we are able to have this uh, webinar together with INCA today on this very, very important day. Uh, and for today, we have a lot of very nice and well-renowned speakers. And the next slide shows you the, the first four speakers. Uh, Marie-Louise van Wolthuysen and Tim Denecker will have uh, a first go and tell you about uh, uh, words that you may uh, be told by your doctor what they mean. Sean Captivilla and Antonio Fagiano will then follow. And the next slide. Then Louis de Mesquie and Amanda Comarunio will um, have the third part and Dick van Genschen and Jackie Herman will finish up. Uh, and the next slide over to you, Mark. Thanks, Eva. So uh, today, as I said, it's, it's very much focused at, as you, the patient, uh, to give you information about this disease and, and, and help you on your journey as, as you traveled uh, in, in, in dealing with, with, with the disease. So we start off with part one, very much focused at, at particularly new patients. And you know, you're often bombarded with terminology. Um, and you hear about SSA and PRT and grades and stages. So, so we're hoping that uh, that we can shed some light on on, on this terminology and, and and take the mystery out of it for you and help you to understand a bit better. In part two, we look at the the treatments that are available in ends, first line and second line and 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 other treatments um, and and try to give you an idea of of how treatments are are selected for you as an individual on your journey. Um, so give you an idea as you as you progress along along your path that to know what treatments are available and, and how you may be selected for them and possibly why not you're not why you're not selected for them. In part three, we're trying to look at what's coming down the track uh, in, in terms of new treatments or variations on treatments and um, and give you an idea of, of, of what's happening in the field, um, which are all really great and, and some wonderful things happening um, to help us as patients and, 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 and give us hope for the future. So part three, we'll look at that. And then in part four, we're going to talk about patient advocacy and support groups and how they can really help you um, and how peer support is useful. Um, and, and how the, these patient groups around the globe can, can really participate and help uh, uh, in improving resources, uh, but also help you on your journey. Uh, and that will take us up to uh, 2.15 Central European time. Uh, during, the, during each session, we have a QA and a time slot allocated. So you're very welcome. And please do use the tool to, to ask questions. And Ava, you're going to explain a little bit about that now. Yes, so if I can have the next slide, please. Uh, during this uh, webinar, we also want to interact with you. Uh, so the speakers have, have produced questions um, that you will uh, vote on in a live poll. Uh, and then you can see the results coming up as um, you are uh, answering. And this is the first question that we would like you to answer because we would very much like to know where you come from. Uh, so, um, uh, please indicate which continent you are from, Europe, Africa, Asia, North America, South America, or Australia. So um, we just wait for a few seconds while you start voting and um, we will see then what the result is. And if we uh, turn to the next page, we can see now that the majority of you are from, from Europe which is uh, quite expected due to the time strains <laughs> that we have. Uh, some are joining from Africa and uh, quite a few from Asia as well. So we will just wait for a few more seconds and see uh, if there are any more people that uh, vote. But yeah, about 85% from, from Europe. So that's very nice to see. And then 
let's go to the next slide. And this is about the Q&A session. So in each um, part of this webinar, we also have quite a lot of time allocated for questions from you who are listening. Uh, and uh, we would very much like you to use this questioning tool where you send questions, you write it in the box and then press send. Uh, you will see the Q&A tool in the uh, slide. Uh, and uh, please uh, do that so that you can have your questions answered by this very competent uh, faculty that are joining us today. today. So uh, we really look forward to that. And finally, I would also like to remind you to uh, answer the participant survey uh, after the webinar to let us know what you think about this event and if um, this is something that you would like to be repeated or if there is something else that you would like us to do. So we also really look forward to your uh, thoughts about this webinar. And by that, I think the next slide uh, is... Uh, about uh, the first part, and I leave the word then to Mark, who will mod moderate this uh, webinar. Thanks, Eva. Um, so, with that, I you know welcome you all to uh, to really enjoy the the presentations. They're all fantastic, and uh, and really use them to make us learn as much about this disease as you can. And and please start answering your questions now. Uh, we will ask answer them as best we can during each of the sessions. So. So I want to start, kick off part one, demystifying then terminology, with thanks to Mary Louise van Veltusen and Tim Denecke, um, who have prepared this information. So over to you both, and thank you for, for, for this. Thank you for giving us uh, the opportunity to, um, to elucidate uh, some of this uh, confusing, often also for doctors, confusing terminology in the neuroendocrine neoplasma area. Uh, and um, many of this terminology has to do with the work uh, Dr. Danica and I am doing that's uh, working as a pathologist and as a radiologist, as these are the first things that need to be done when uh, dealing with a patient with a tumor. You need to know the tumor type the grade and the stage to know how to treat them. And many of these terminology things uh, are dealing with these uh, things. Can I have the next slide? Um, and so uh, I, as a pathologist, are mostly dealing with the typing and the grading of these tumors. And I will tell you uh, how we do it and what are the main things in it. And then uh, I'll pass the word to my colleague, uh, Dr. Dedeke. Next slide, please. Um, so we are dealing with neuroendocrine tumors in this uh, uh, webinar and uh, neuroendocrine tumors are part of neuroendocrine neoplasms. And uh, can I, can, do I have a pointer? I don't, huh? No, I think. So you see the circle on the left side uh, where you see the entity of neuroendocrine neoplasm and you see that neuroendocrine tumors, the net are part of this. And these are well differentiated tumors, as you can see on the right side of the uh, slide, where you see that they are formed of cells in groups which, which look very irregular. And that is opposed to uh, uh, the picture, which is uh, lower down on the right side of the slide, which is a poorly differentiated tumor and which could be a neuroendocrine carcinoma, which is a other group of tumors within the neuroendocrine neoplasms, but with which we are not dealing uh, today. So neuroendocrine tumors, which with we are dealing now, are well differentiated neoplasms. And can I have the next slide? And of course, they are neuroendocrine. And what does that mean that it is neuroendocrine? It means that it is composed of cells which are neuroendocrine, and they are mainly uh, producing hormones. And in this um, um, picture, you can see such a neuroendocrine cell and all the components are important to understand how we are typing and grading these cells. 
So on the surface, we see the five on the left side of the cell. Uh, it, it's a pity I can. We see the five uh, uh, zomatostatin receptors, uh, which will be also very important when we are dealing later on with uh, uh, ra uh, radiology and uh, therapy. Uh, but and in the uh, cytoplasm, in, in the cell itself, you see one globule, you see the nucleus, and next to it, more higher up, you see the globules, and those are the ones that contain hormones. And those are the ones that characterize the neuroendocrine cells, because these hormones are in these packed in these globules, and in the membrane of these globules is a protein that's called chromogranin, and uh, also there is syn synaptophysin, and uh, um, uh, we, uh, as pathologists, we use this chromogranin and cytophysin to show that these cells are neuroendocrine. Can I have the next slide? So these neuroendocrine cells have somatostatin receptors on the surface. And when these receptors are stimulated, the hormone content of these glob glob globules is uh, comes out in the circulations. And um, we as pathologists, we know, we recognize these cells as neuroendocrines because we can recognize these proteins, this synaptophysin and chromogranin. Uh, but this chromogranin and these hormones can also be found in the circulation when uh, blood is taken and when we want to know how is the tumor doing or what kind of tumor might it be. Uh, and that's how they are, when they are measured in blood, blood, they are used as tumor markers. And uh, one of these hormones, when it is degraded, uh, it, uh, there is a compound and that is 5-H-I-A-A, 5-5-HIA. And this is a degradation product of serotonin. And uh, nowadays, still, we are still measuring, measuring mostly this in 24 hours urine because this is the most reliable way to find this hormone. And I think in this uh, webinar, we won't talk a lot about the uh, carcinoid syndrome, which is related to the production of serotonin, but it is also one of the important uh, signs and uh, problems you are dealing with when you're having this tumor. Next slide. Um, next slide. So a uh, neuroendocrine tumor is a well-differentiated tumor that is hormone produced. It has SSTR on its surface and uh, chromogranin and serotonin is an important uh, hormone that is produced and we can measure the 5-HEI in blood, but mostly in urine. Next slide. Then to know how these tumors are behaving, we need to grade them. Uh, and for that, we have uh, two uh, ways of grading these tumors. Either we look at mitosis, and that's something we are looking at in the H&E slide. So that are the, the pink and blue uh, part on the left side, the images. Uh, and it is a pity, I, I should have put it on the slide, that in the upper part, in the uh, picture I showed you before, there's no mitotic figures that can be seen, but in the picture just below, there's two of them, um, but they, they are difficult to recognize. Uh, but we are looking for them as pathologists. And another measure of it is that we are demonstrating a protein, the key Y67, and on the left part, uh, pictures, you can see them as brown nuclei. And you can see in the upper part, there's only one brown, really one dark brown nucleus. And uh, so there, the QI67 will be very low, perhaps 1% or less. And in the lower part, you see many brown nuclei. And there, the QI67 would be about 10%. So it would be a higher grade tumor, a grade two. Okay, so next slide. So that is about grading. 
So we grade according to two parameters, mitotic index and key mitotic grade and key Y67. And we type the tumor uh, on the way it looks in morphology and uh, the, the proteins that are expressed. So I give the word to my colleague, Tim Danke. Thank you so much, Marie-Louise. I always learn something from pathologist talks. And uh, now I would like uh, to move with me from microscopy to macroscopy. So what is staging actually? It's, staging means determination of the actual tumor spread, not locally in, in, in micro vessels or something, but throughout the entire body. So we want to know which organ systems are involved by the primary tumor or its metastasis. So the tumor spread is always the local growth, mostly of the primary and the metastatic spread to other organ systems. And to know this accurately is absolutely important to decide whether, for example, a curative resection is possible or rather a systemic treatment should be chosen. So it's a really a cornerstone a break point of patient management in this regard. First of all, we have to think where to look for metastases and tumor spread. There are sister organs which are often involved, especially in gastrointestinal neuroendocrine, neoplasias like the lymph nodes, like the liver, for example, but also bones and lung can be involved at early stages rarely involved, but also relevant for staging in neuroendocrine tumors is, for example, the orbit, like the eye muscles, for example, or the muscle of the heart, or also the female breast. So we have uh, occasionally metastases at early stages in those regions, which can be uh, important uh, for therapy decision-making. So the question is, next please, um, how to complete this task? What diagnostic imaging do we need and which modality is best suited to accomplish this mission? Next one. So first of all, ultrasound comes to our mind, but it is relatively cheap and has no radiation. It's accessible easily, but its sensitivity is limited and it's of course not a whole body mortality. With the use of intravenous ultrasound contrast material, it is possible to improve the sensitivity in certain regions, like for example, the liver, and we like to use it as a problem solver in unclear findings of CT, for example. And the endoscopic insertion of special ultrasound pro probes is also very good uh, to get closer, for example, to the pancreas and to look precisely there where the tumor nodules are to be seen. But for staging in the whole body, it is not really the method of choice. Next one. Next one, please. Um, moving to computed tomography, it's like the working horse of whole body staging. So rapid scan, relatively cheap, accessible everywhere, uh, whole body method, 3D imaging. Um, on the other hand, it has a limited sensitivity, especially for very small metastases, which are important to be seen and are quite frequent uh, in endocrine neoplasias. Uh, so furthermore, we have X-ray exposure and we have to use intravenous contrast agent to overcome the, the limited sensitivity of small metastases. As you can see in the right lower corner of the slide, a, a small liver metastasis, which is only to be seen in the arterial phase because of the typical hypervascularization of those tumors. So we need a multiphasic imaging, which increases even more the X-ray exposure. So this is the trade-off on the one hand, but we have the opportunity to accurately geometrically measure the tumor size, which is important then when it comes to therapy control to see whether the tumor responds, uh, responds with shrinkage or uh, whether it uh, keeps on growing. Next slide, please. So staging working horse CT. Next slide. <clears throat> MR can do better, but 
to, to have a higher sensitivity than CT, for example, in the liver, uh, we have to use special techniques like uh, diffusion weighted imaging, hepatocyte specific contrast agents, or something like that. And that takes a while. Also, looking for metastases in the heart is a special examination protocol. For the brain, again, a special examination protocol. So there are whole body imaging protocols with MR, but if you do that in one hour, you will not reach the highest possible sensitivity of a dedicated liver scan, for example, inside the liver. Um, next, please. So even though it does not have any harm with radiation or something, um, the MR is not so good for a general whole body staging, but it is a perfect add-on in equivocal CT findings, for example, or to really know the most accurately the stage inside the liver before a local treatment like resection is being applied. Next, please. <clears throat> Coming to the functional imaging modalities, the positron emission tomography is uh, more and more getting you know, the, the nuclear medicine standard for imaging in the endocrine neoplasias. There are several tracers which are used to uh, color or to mark the tumor, and they are slightly weakly radioactive, and this radioactive emitted radiation can be detected by the PET scanner, and this makes a very nice 3D image of the whole body. One tracer which is widely uh, used is FDG, which is a glucose uh, type of um, uh, radio pharmacy, um, and this uh, is used in aggressive tumors, meaning higher grade G3 or new endocrine carcinomas, as you have learned in the previous talk. The lower grade tumors, G1, G2, neuroendocrine tumors, so to say, they do not have such a increased glucose metabolism and may be invisible on the FDG PET. So we need to use uh, an, another trick, which is the somatostatin receptor, which you have learned in the previous talk as well. So there is a radial ligand which can be used to dock on this receptor, which is increased in neuroendocrine tumor cells. And that's the way they light up, like you see in the right upper corner of the slide. And this is a very exact and very accurate met method to make even small lesions inside the bone, the heart or whatever visible to the camera and the doctor. Uh, the tracer being used uh, is gallium 68, uh, more labeled Dota talk or Dota Tate or whatever. So uh, in the common tongue, it's called the gallium pet. And a very nice feature of this is that the same target, the somatostatin receptors used for imaging can be used for radiotherapy as well. So you take this, the same peptide and exchange the a weakly radioactive radionuclide on it against a stronger one, which is not only visible, but also destructs the cells around the, the lodging place. So it destructs the tumor tissue. So that is a very smart approach called the PRRT. And the combination of planning this with gallium PET and then coming to dosimetry and performing the therapy is a combination nation of diagnostics and therapy called the Theranostic approach. Next one. So SRPET is a method of choice for staging, but because of price and radiation, it is approximately used every one or two years in endocrine tumor patients, and it should be uh, combined with a contrast-enhanced CT scan, which is easily possible because the CT and the PET camera are kind of fused in a hybrid scanner. So at the same time, both can be provided. Next one. Coming to other buzzwords like restaging, follow-up and response assessment. So restaging is describing like a repeated staging procedure at a breakpoint after completion of a therapy and before determining the further uh, course. And then we have the follow-up. This is meant to be controlling of patients in sequential intervals who are actually meant to be free of disease. For example, after curative or radiological uh, 
uh, uh, local therapies or resection. So the, the endpoint we are looking for is the disease-free survival, DFS, or the local control of irradiated or ablated lesions. And then we come to the response assessment in patients with known tumor treated with systemic or regional therapies, as you will learn in the following uh, talks. And of course, we have to know whether the tumor increases in size or shrinks. And this is called the tumor response. And to make this objective, uh, we call it the objective response rate, we have to make it visible. And this is most importantly done by measuring the tumor size with diagnostic imaging CT, for example. The response categories available are uh, coined in the RESIS response criterion solid tumor catalog, the progressive disease with an increase of the diameter of the lesions by more than 20%, the partial response, so substantial shrinkage by 30%, in between the stable disease, with unchanged tumor or rather unchanged tumor, or the tumor that would be the best scenario, it's completely gone, that would be complete response, CR. When you reach a partial response state and later on the tumor progresses again, the partial response is called the nadia, which is like a new baseline from which on it is measured to reach 20% of increase to call it later on progressive disease. And that would show us that we have to change something in our therapeutic management. Next one. So the radiologist needs to know to determine response to therapy the very start of the therapy, the type of the therapy, of course, the, the baseline images, and the state of best response or nadia to make a proper assessment. RESIST and its full regulatory protocol is a study tool used in large cohorts and studies. Progression-free survival is that what we are looking for and the objective response rate, of course. But if it comes to an individual patient which has to be, uh, who has to be assessed by imaging, this is done far more uh, complexly. And it uses similar cutoffs for a better comparison with trial results, for example. But uh, the, the way a radiologist approaches the scan and reads the scan, of course, uh, has many more aspects in mind and in discussion with a referring physician than in a blinded assessment, we pure resist assessment of study patients. So next one, please. I think I come to the end and complete the image of the grade, the type and the stage. And I added some terms, some mystic terms, demystified now for you as outcome measures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim and Mary Louise, for an excellent presentation and explaining some of the terminology that, that we as patients encounter along along the way. Um, so I invite you now to uh, to be part of the, of the discussion of question on our question and answer for this session. Um, and maybe I can kick it off by uh, a question that was posted. Uh, question seven: Can KI sixty seven evolve over time? Um, yes, it can. Um, um, it can also stay very stable, but uh, uh, tumors can progress. So uh, that is a, uh, can be a reason to re-biopsy a, a tumor to if, if, if the behavior is not as expected to get a new biopsy, uh, to get a new assessment of the tumor grade. So the treating physician will... Uh, based on what's happening with the patient, may seek to to have a, a new determination of KI67 at some point in time. Yes, especially if in uh, uh, imaging uh, you see a stronger pro progression of the tumor or area, and then it is important to especially biopsy the areas where the radiologist says there is really tumor growth at this place. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, question eight, um, can uh, CT scans see metastases in bones? Well, yes, it can, but uh, CT more shows the bony structure. So it needs some change of the bony structure to uh, get the tumor visible. If you take uh, other imaging methods like the direct uh, visualization of the tumor by MR, it would be more sensible and would be positive earlier than CT. 
And the same is true for the nuclear medicine approaches with uh, scintigraphy or PET. Okay, thank you. Uh, question nine, um, can F18 plus a ligand be used instead of gallium-68? A ligand or what? It just, the, the question is, does F18 plus ligand be used instead of gallium-68? Um, not, not clear what, what the F8, patient is asking. F18? Mm. Okay, let's 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 look at another question. Um, can a net tumor express histamine as well? Question six. Uh, I think uh, the question is now clear, made clear in the chat. So, ah, F4, okay. is is it fluor eighteen, which was asked for? That seems to be what what the chat is saying. Yes, fluor eighteen. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the ligands are more easily linked to gallium-68. And for that reason, this is the, the majority of use. And there are some um, experimental ligands which can be marked with, uh, labeled with fluorating as well. Okay, and then question six, um, can a net tumor express histamine? Do you want me to answer this? Yes, um, please. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we never look for it, and I don't think uh, uh, it is a, a, a protein that is or a hormone that is produced by neuroendocrine cells. It's more produced by uh, uh, leukocytes uh, in allergic reactions. Um, so I think if histamine is produced in the context of a tumor, it would be infiltrating uh, uh, granulocytes the, uh, that produce the histamine. Uh, but we we never look at histamine in um, uh, tumors. Okay, thank you. Um, question uh, 10. What kind of nets on tumor cells tend to have a higher si KI67? Um, what kind of net or tumor cells? Yeah, that's the question. What, what, well, what kind uh, of net? Well, the, so the... Uh, um, that's why we grade the net. So if a net has a few KY67 cells, we think it's, uh, we, we know it is not proliferating a lot. So we will see that, uh, uh, and we will call it grade one if there's no proliferation, grade two if there's more proliferation, and, uh, and we have cutoff levels to call these grades. So the high grade, the grade three uh, neuroendocrine tumors will have much more KY67 positive cells than the grade one neuroendocrine tumors. And the, and the neuroendocrine carcinomas, which we do not discuss today, they even have more, in general, more um, uh, KY67 positive cells. And to compare this, with uh, more uh, uh, garden variety carcinomas, they are a little bit in between or uh, like the neuroendocrine tumors grade three. So breast carcinomas of, often have a, a KY60 index of uh, uh, between 10 and, 10 and 30 or something like this. So Mary Louise, it's really saying that the KI67 is a measurement um of the tumor um, aggressiveness in, in some respects. Yes, yes, yes. And this determines, so the tumor, the tumor grade is a measure of the aggressiveness, aggressiveness of the tumor, yeah. Okay. Um, there's a question, uh, question two, um, about PRT and can it cure or can it decrease the tumor size? It's a little bit related to what you were mentioning, Tim, about the um, somatostatin, um, SSTR uh, expression. Do you want to take that one? Um, so the question was how the PRRT is related to? The yeah, how uh, is P PRT, can it cure or decrease the tumor size? And I know you referenced that in your discussion. So it would be um, among the palliative treatments like chemotherapy or any systemic treatment. And it is capable of shrinking the tumor, reaching a partial response, complete response is more rarely achieved, actually. Okay, thank you. Um, question 12. Um, 
With monitoring, um, are there any other blood tests which are more reliable than chromogranin A? Um, yeah, I think this is a question to me, but uh, I am not a clinician uh, measuring, uh, using these measurements. Um, and so perhaps uh, this is a question to ask uh, for the uh, next uh, speakers. Okay. So do we have any other questions from the people watching? Okay, well, maybe maybe there is one more question, uh, a little bit of a, of a long one, um, but question four, um, really about a, a, a person who's had PRT and um, they're getting conflicting treatment about how long they need to stay away from other people after getting that radiation therapy. Um, and so they're really saying, is there is there any sort of conform, conforming information about how long you should uh, be aware of, of interacting with other people? Um, after having PRT. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm radiologist primarily, and it has been a long time that I myself treated patients with PRT. But I think in terms of uh, half-life of this radionuclide, which is being used there, it should be probably like uh, a few days only. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Tim. Okay, so I think I think we've probably actually sorry. There is another question. Thirteen, is it normally assumed that secondary metastasis has the same grading and structure of the primary net tumor? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, mostly it is, but it is not always the case. And uh, I, uh, especially uh, uh, we see in, in metastasis in, uh, uh, that the, the grade uh, is, is higher than in the primary tumor. So, um, and, and that's the, pro the, pro the general problem with biology. N nothing is always one way and there's always exceptions, but I think this higher grade on other areas of the tumor it's 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 uh, usually not the case, but it is quite often happening that we see a grade two two tumor in the liver metastasis, while in the primary tumor we had seen a grade one. But we do not know. Then often there's also a time lap between those two measurements, uh, so it's difficult to to see if this is uh, evolving of the tumor in time or. Um, but also if they are uh, may, uh, done together, those biopsies, we can see differences in the different places of the tumor. Yeah. But obviously it's only found uh, by doing biopsies on those metastases. Yeah. Um, and that obviously is, ob I presume, triggered by suspicion of the treating clinician and yeah. the need for to decide about treatments. Yeah. So that's uh, something very uh, important to uh, be able to discuss in uh, multidisciplinary teams to see uh, what it, what is co causing the problem and uh, why you would have in imaging first what is happening with the tumor and uh, then deciding if if another biopsy is needed to get some answers. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask one more question, if that's okay. Yeah, uh, question five. Um, it's a nuclear scan, and uh, it says TC99MMDP plus the right scan to diagnose spinal or liver tumors. If there are net tumors elsewhere, um, is that a too specific a question? So that was the, the bone scan. Huh? Yes. Technetium 99MDPD. Uh, and that's that's yeah, bone scintigraphy, and that would be suitable to uh, find bone metastases a bit earlier than they would be positive on CT, for example. But for liver imaging, that is not suitable. This is only meant to visualize uh, bone metabolism. Okay. Thank you all. So I think I think we'll we'll put a, bring uh, part one to an end at this point in time. Um, thank you, Mary Louise, and thank you, Tim, for a wonderful presentation and explanation of those of the terms and and and, and taking those questions. Um, so I want to now bring and introduce the speakers for part two about how we select between established treatments and advanced NEN. And our speakers are Anton Giulio Fagiano, an endocrinologist from Italy, and Jean-Marc Captavia from uh, Spain, an oncologist. 
So um, delighted that the uh, speakers are going to talk about um, how patients are, are, are chosen uh, for different therapies, what sort of therapies are available, and, uh, and the, the typical journey that a patient may experience. So um, over to you both for, for this um, presentation. So hello, everyone, and thank you, Mark, for the, for the introduction. And I'm sure also talking about, no, from, from Anton Julio's thoughts, so it's, a, it's a real pleasure for us to be here today and, and to talk how we may sequence therapies in, in advanced neuroendocrine neoplasms. So to try to break a little bit the ice, so please, can you move to the next one? We will start with a, with a question. So uh, how many different systemic therapies do you think are currently available for advanced neuroendocrine neoplasms? So uh, option one is two at a maximum. Option two is three in the specialized centers. Four, if we count the terrible chemotherapy. Five, if the recent studies allow rapid approvals, or more than six, and they will never be enough. So please, can you share your thoughts with us? Don't be shy, participate. This is, this is an open meeting. So what we want to know is, you know, which is the general idea, and, and try to give clear messages during the next few minutes about the, the options that we may have. So what we can see that we have different, you know, different ideas. Uh, as an oncologist, you know, being being in the other side of the table, uh, for me, it's never enough what we have. You know? uh, we should have not only six, probably 6,000, that this is clearly related with the final outcomes of the diseases. Uh, in, in any kind of cancers and, of course, any kind of diseases. So uh, if, you, if you move to the next one, so I have more or less the idea. So look here. So this is, this is a, a picture that tries to generate the concept of if we try to design a clinical trial that may... And analyze which is the best sequence of the different treatment options in pancreatic nets in the left, in the left, and small intestine in the right. You can see here that at least, at least, there are seven different treatment options for pancreas, and four or five different treatment options for the small intestine. So we have different approvals around the world. So you can see here the the, the colors, but at the end. The message here is that if we have only three treatment options, we may have six different sequential therapies, no? ABC or VCA or whatever. So imagine if we have seven treatment options. So this means that we have more than 5,000 different sequences. So it's impossible from the concept of designing a clinical trial to, no, to have a general overview of the different treatment options and which is the best, uh, the best to use first, second, third, and fourth. So how we make decisions here. So please move to the next one. So we try to look at the clinical trials and see, well, what they teach us. So the problem of clinical trials is the, that at, when, when you design that clinical trial, you usually spend many years to so recruit, no, to, to have the, the, the design finalized, to have the resources, to recruit patients, and at the end, to have the results. And things evolve. Things evolve because we have new treatment options that change the scenario. And then finally, when we have the results, we need to implement those results in the current practice of, uh, at that time point. So why am I saying that? Because, for instance, if we use some of those analogs, it's something that we usually use at the beginning of the disease, in first line, in those diseases that have good prognostic characteristics. When this design, when the design of these studies were done, and they were done by you know, at the end of the 2000s, so almost 15 or 20 years ago. So the things changed and changed a lot. For instance, for targeted agents, when sunitinib and everolimus went to the phase three studies, there were no 
PRT on the market everywhere. So we were using PRT in Europe, but not as a, a registered uh, therapy. So what we can uh, try to conclude from these phase three studies is that half of the patients that received sunitinib or everolimus in the pancreatic origin received chemotherapy before. So we don't know if we should use targeted agents after or before chemotherapy. With PRD and small intestine nets, here probably the, the, the sequence is much more clear, somatostatin analogs first and PRT second. But we are having more and more evidence that PRT sometimes could be useful for the line. So again, we need more data. What happens with pancreatic nets? With pancreatic nets, we have only one prospective clinical trial that evaluated uh, and compared PRT and sunitinib. But in this clinical trial, more than 50% of the patients received chemotherapy before. So we should think that PRT should be used after chemotherapy based on this study. What happens with chemotherapy? Temozolamide-based or, or streptozotozyme-based? So again, we have few clinical trials. The only and the most recent one that is comparing a targeted agent and a chemotherapy is the streptozotozyme 5 fu uh, sector trial that compared that, everolimus and streptozotozyme. Chemotherapy is a more potent uh, treatment strategy, produces more responses, but at the end, we have the same progression-free survival. So again, difficult and probably based patient by patient and characteristic by characteristics. We are not focusing on neuroendocrine carcinomas, but we have also data on first line with chemotherapy, platinum-based chemotherapy for neuroendocrine carcinomas, but we don't have any kind of data for second, third, and, uh, uh, and beyond uh, therapies. What happens with lung nets? Lung nets, we have Everolimus on label with a phase three study, but we use somatostatin analogs. We use PRT and we use chemotherapy and sometimes even before the neverolimus, and we don't have that data coming from trials. And what I said at the beginning, net G3 tumors, those that are well differentiated, but, but with a key A67 over 20%, this new classification is for the last couple of years, and trials were designed a decade ago. So we have few data here. So please move to the next one. So in the next... For slides, I will try to summarize a little bit what we have and which is the rationale to use each of these systemic therapies. If we start with somatostatin analogs, I believe that this is you know, the main therapy that we use for those that are well differentiated tumors, G1 and G2 from almost all origins, because we have prospective studies, uh, comparative prospective studies with somatostatin analogs in small intestine nets, in pancreatic, and also in lung neuroendocrine tumors. So as I said at the beginning, this is for those diseases with good prognostic characteristics. What are the, uh, the somatostatin analogs doing? So they join these somatostatin receptors, mainly the number two and number five, and what we, the, 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 the efficacy, you know, the effect uh, on, the, on the tumor and on the cell are, uh, uh, you can see that on here on this, on this picture. So we stop the tumor growth, we may induce a, uh, a cell death, and it's important that we inhibit the secretion of hormones. So it's the main therapy for hormone-related syndromes. They have usually an excellent safety profile, but what usually happens is that we may see sooner or later a resistance to these therapies, and the tumor finally will grow. Please move to the next one. So what we have more here? So we have targeted agents. What means targeted agents? Targeted agents are usually small molecules that block different parts of the cell that are that, that the cell needs to grow. So we have mainly everolimus and sunitinib. Everolimus is an mTOR inhibitor. You can see here in this, in this uh, highlighted here in red, in, in the center of the cell. And so the everolimus goes there and blocks this protein. And sunitinib is a multikinase inhibitor that blocks mainly the receptors that are uh, in the surface of the cell, mainly those that are related with the angiogenesis process. So this is an anti-angiogenic drug. So what we see with these compounds, we see mainly stabilizations, few responses. No, the, the, the resist responses that were discussed just, just on, the, on the talk before. So with sunitinib, around 10% of patients may achieve a partial response, but with Iberolimus, this is 
ranges between two and five percent. So these are drugs that usually stabilize the disease at a mid or a long term. What about side effects? So we are used to use this kind of drugs in oncology, not only in neuroendocrine tumors, and even combinations of these drugs. So we are quite used to manage. We know which side effects may appear. We can manage them, but not always. Sometimes we need those reductions to control them, and sometimes, unfortunately, discontinuation because we cannot control the side effects. Which are those side effects? Those clearly related with the mechanism of action of these compounds. For this mTOR inhibition in the center of the cell, we may see, so you can see here, no, hyperglycemia, diarrhea, rash, we reduce and the lymphocyte count, so we may see opportunistic infections, and we may see also inflammation of the lung not related with infections, that this is pneumonitis. And these are the, clinic, the, the typical side effects of eperolimus. What happens with sunitinib? With sunitinib, we may have fatigue, GI disorders, and this is an anti-angiogenic drug, as I said at the beginning. So we may see vascular effects, hypertension, or, or, or others that are more dangerous, let's say, like, like thrombosis, hemorrhages, or uh, fistula or perforation. So we, we know the side effects, and so we may predict them, and if we can prevent, much better. Move to the next one, please. And what about the horrible chemotherapy? So chemotherapy, well, you know, it's uh, it's slightly more toxic if we compare that with other kind of therapies. But again, this is the main therapy that we use in oncology. Almost all types of cancer are treated with chemotherapy in combinations. Uh, but this is what we use to try to offer the maximum benefit of this of these therapies are usually well known. How we use them in neuroendocrine neoplasms. So for neuroendocrine carcinomas is the main therapy at the beginning, platinum-based chemotherapy. And then we have problems later on with because we have few data after progression to this first-line therapy. But what, uh, what happens in well-differentiated tumors? So in pancreatic nets, chemotherapy is a main therapy. It's all sometimes, no, it's not enough fashion, let's say, but it's a main therapy, produces nice responses, and sometimes is indicated in first line. More in those tumors that are slightly more aggressive, high G2, G3, high tumor burden, rapid progression, symptoms related with the disease, then chemotherapy may produce a uh, higher benefit. What happens with the small intestine? So we may, say, we may say that we have a residual indication here, only for those that are atypical. Atypical small intestine nets means, means that those that have a higher KX67, a higher aggressive behavior, different sites of, of distant metastasis, for instance, uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis. So these are poor characteristics for a small intestine net. So sometimes, at, at some time of the evolution of the disease, we may use also chemotherapy here. And also we may use chemotherapy in lung nets. But for sure, not that chemotherapy that is used in a small cell lung cancer. So the neuroendocrine tumor that is a carcinoma from the lung. And what about toxicity? Toxicity, again, is related with the mechanism of action of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy usually produces this uh, damage on the, on, the, on the DNA and produces uh, cell death. So we have GI toxicity, hair loss, fatigue, and of course, bone marrow toxicity with decrease of white blood cells and platelets mainly. And finally, if you move to the next one, we have the PRT. The PRT, it has been uh, a wide used strategy to treat different kinds of cancers and also neuroendocrine tumors in Europe during many, many years or even decades. Finally, we had a phase three study that demonstrated that this uh, therapy works nicely in, in small intestine nets, but we have also information that this therapy is useful in other kinds of uh, tumors. Uh, that express this somatostin receptor too. So here in the picture, you can see how it works, the, the, the PRD. So it's injected into the, into the blood vessels and then goes directly to the receptor of somatostatin. Uh, again, we are using this uh, somatostin analog, but with a ligand that produces radiation. This is internalized to the cell and then it may destroy, destroy the, the, the cell. It's quite selective for these tumor cells, but we have also expression of somatostin receptors in other parts of the body. So we may have toxicity. Which kind of toxicity? So bone marrow toxicity is typical, but we may also lose hair. We may have also uh, muscle pain. So 
it's in general, it's a very well tolerated compound, but we may have also toxicity. Toxicity also at the time of uh, removing this compound from the body because it's removed by the kidney. And sometimes if we do not block perfectly the reabsorption, we may have uh, kidney injuries. Uh, um, responses. Responses are seen in some patients. I cannot say that, well, we see high number of partial responses. We usually see responses in a small intestine is around 20%. We need to know which kind of percentages we may see in, a small, in, in pancreatic and in uh, lung nets in prospective studies. But it, what it's clearly seen is that when we treat patients with PRRT, we see improvements in symptoms and in quality of life. So I'm pretty sure that we are not capturing all the benefit of PRRT when it's used in neuroendocrine tumor patients. And well, uh, we have prospective studies that we will have a guess uh, initial data in the next couple of years. And the last one for me, uh, so how we integrate all this information in our daily clinical practice. So we have these three arms for decision. Of course, based, based on patient characteristics that I said during my, my talk, not different to more burden, aggressiveness, expression of, of receptors, but also patient characteristics. Sometimes we may use something that it cannot be used because of the comorbidities, because of the performance status, age, or maybe by your preference, that sometimes you may prefer one thing or another thing. And also in all countries, we need to, de to deal with the health system characteristics. In not everywhere, not on in all countries, we have the same access to the, to the drugs. And even in the same country, we have difference, uh, differences yeah, between regions. With that, uh, I would leave the floor to Anton Julio, so uh, thank you for, for, for your attention and waiting for the discussion at the end. Thank you, Jaume, and good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to share with you this uh, uh, really nice symposium about uh, uh, men in uh, patient-oriented men. So, uh, Jaume talked about the uh, different possibility to treat this kind of tumor, but we have to, uh, and uh, in this attempt, we have to take in mind that uh, our uh, tumor board uh, need to be multidisciplinary with a lot of specialists, such as pathologists, gastroenterologists, uh, nuclear medicine physician, uh, oncologists, of course, endocrinologists, and, uh, and so on. But uh, next, please. Uh, we have to uh, also um, pose question about uh, about patient, about uh, quality of life of, of patient. I want to start my my part of the talk with this question for you. What's the best diet regimen in a non patient under therapy with somatostatin analog? So. Uh, first one is low protein diet, second low carbohydrate diet, three low fat diet, four one and two, and five uh, two and three. Please uh, give your preference. The, the, the response is right because uh, we have to consider uh, uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of patient uh, low fat diet in general and low carbon diet because many um, uh, causes of hyperglycemia and uh, dyslipidemia are in this patient because this patient can produce some uh, hormones increasing glycemia, for example, glucagon or cortisol. And uh, otherwise, there are some effects of, uh, of, uh, of drugs that can impact on, uh, on this aspect. So we have to take in mind uh, this uh, condition, this situation, and then we have to uh, prefer the uh, right regimen with adequate protein content and uh, low, uh, simple carbohydrate in particular, low fat diet. Next, please. So uh, in uh, the multidisciplinary uh, tumor board for men patient, it's really, really important to consider other specialists, for example, dietitians, nutritionists, and also endocrinologists and gastroenterologists oriented in this, in this sense uh, with expertise for uh, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, uh, malnutrition. 
take in mind that uh, many, many patients, many, many oncological patients, and also many men patients are uh, uh, metabolic and sometimes are obese. And even obese patients can be malnourished. So we can have a patient in our way, but malnourished. So it's a, it's a, it's a really peculiar condition that we have to, to take in mind by, by suggesting the right uh, lifestyle. Uh, and uh, the most important thing in this, in this sense is in, the, in this meaning is to suggest the right uh, uh, diet regimen. Also, it's really important to uh, having the uh, multidisciplinary team uh, um, physician uh, with expertise for pain management and fatigue management because this is, uh, this uh, two points are really, really frequent in general in patient uh, with uh, in neoplasia, but in particular patient with uh, neuroendocrine neoplasia, which are characterized by long time uh, survival. And they are, uh, they experienced a lot of different phase of disease and also different uh, um, line of therapy with the, the possible uh, uh, side effect associated. So we have to consider uh, to improve their quality of life, also um, preventing and treating uh, fatigue and pain, which are possible for different reasons, for effect of, of, uh, of hormones, for, uh, for tumor growth, and for the effect of, uh, of, uh, of drugs used as anti-tumor therapy. Also consider uh, psychological pain. Psychological pain is something which is really important to, to raise and to, and to discuss with the patient and also with the caregiver of the patient. So we, uh, uh, it's important to, to consider this aspect at the beginning, from the beginning, and also to consider the different phase of the patient in terms of uh, psychological state. Next one, please. No, uh, first one. Okay. Uh, about diet regimen. Uh, so we are what we eat. So it's really uh, crucial to uh, prepare the patient to uh, to uh, receive some drug, some specific treatment, which can uh, be influenced by some food, some specific food. I can give the example of uh, uh, grapefruit and everolinus, because there is uh, uh, an enzymatic uh, interference uh, between this kind of fruit and uh, everolinus. But also consider uh, the, the state of disease and the possible association with endocrine syndrome. If we have carcinoid uh, syndrome uh, inducing diarrhea, you have to, to consider this in, in our uh, suggestion for a right diet regimen. So in general, it's really important to improve lifestyle and improve uh, the quality of the food. Uh, by uh, reducing uh, uh, the quantity of uh, um, simple car carbohydrates and fats and increase the, 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 uh, the, um, the quantity of uh, vegetables, uh, proteins, and so on. And uh, uh, consider always the, uh, the type of uh, the type of treatment which can be influenced by food and also uh, patient comorbidities because some patients uh, can uh, be in a state not accepting to, to, to eat a lot of food uh, and, uh, and beverage. So we have to, 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 to try to, uh, to find the right uh, implementation of, um, of this uh, alimentation. So also consider some uh, integration of the, the, the diet regimen of our patients. Next, please. Another important aspect that uh, we have to take always in mind is about bone health. 
not only because uh, about uh, uh, a, a subgroup of patients with NAN can develop bone metastasis, about 10-15% in differences, but also because by the age, all these patients can develop uh, bone alterations, such as um, postmenopausal osteoporosis or even in male senile osteoporosis. So in patients with uh, an oncological disease, a chronic oncological disease, such as uh, Neuroendocrine neoplasm, uh, we have to consider this aspect because uh, uh, a, a condition of osteoporosis in a patient with men with active disease is really more difficult to manage uh, with, compared to a general population without tumor. So we have to prevent, if it's possible, bone damage. We have to, for example, um, evaluate uh, vitamin D uh, concentration in all, uh, our patient and replace uh, vitamin D if uh, is uh, defined, if, 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 if there is a deficiency of vitamin D. And this is just an example, but also we have to consider many uh, possible uh, treatment that can be improved the quality of life in, in the minimum of uh, bone health, for example, using also to prevent uh, pain uh, due to uh, bone metastasis, for example, using drugs such as uh, bisphosphonate or denosumab. Next uh, slide, please. And, uh, and uh, uh, I, want to, um, I want to stress the importance of a psychological uh, uh, support for this patient because uh, uh, all patients with, a, with a, a, a new diagnosis of neoplasia uh, is, uh, has to face a, a, a terrible uh, drama for uh, for, uh, for himself and for his life, for his family. So we have to um, be really empathic with our patient and also to involve uh, some specialists, some psychologists or psychiatric, psychiatric to, um, to, 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 to try to help our patient and to uh, improve the compliance to uh, the strategy, the therapeutic strategy that we have to decide for, uh, for the patient. Because some patients can be negative in uh, accepting, uh, for example, a kind of treatment, for example, chemotherapy, as Jaume said before. So we have to really consider this point and prevent possible discomfort uh, from the patient and also from caregivers and also it's really important to consider pain management. An expert of pain management uh, is really, really required in a multidisciplinary team for the management of land patient. Next uh, and last slide, please. So I want to conclude with this statement uh, because an holistic approach with, uh, with increasingly personalized treatment allows the clinician to better focus the attention on the patient rather than just on disease. Moreover, it allows us to combine traditional oncological treatment according to the most recent guideline as, as explained as well explained before, with methods that make this treatment less tiring and more effective and finally guarantee the patient the best chances of recovery and the full recovery of psychological work. Thank you. Thank you, Anton Giulio, and thank you, Jaume, for uh, excellent presentations. And, uh, you know, as patient, delighted to see the uh, the waiting that you explained, Anton Giulio, about uh, quality of life and the importance of that in the, in the decision making for treating the patient. And uh, Jaume, for such a wonderful uh, presentation on the different types of treatments available and, and what's for the different types of nets. So I know we're running slightly behind time, but we have a lot of really great questions. So um, uh, I'm going to ask. Um, I don't know, uh, Jaume or, or Anton Julio, a question, but uh, what is the average time that SSAs continue to work before resistance occurs? That's question 19. Well, it, it, it depends. It depends on the on the key ACT7 and mainly also uh, on the primary tumor. So for a small intestine nets, usually with a low key ACT7, we can be on therapy some years. And for pancreatic and for lung net that are slightly more aggressive. So we usually see you know, this tachyphylaxis, this uh, resistance uh, much earlier. 
Okay, and uh, there's a sort of follow-up question on question uh, 18. Um, if they see resistance with uh, one of the two SSA treatments, um, should they switch to another SSA or actually go to a different treatment? Well, uh, I, I'm not sure if we only change the SSA, the, we will see any 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 efficacy. Another thing could be to increase the doses because the current somatosis analogs are surely underdosed. So there are new strategies and there are new phase three studies that are testing high doses, really high doses of somatostatin analogs. Uh, shorting the usually shorting the the period of this of these analogs no instead of every four weeks using that every two weeks we have a clinical trial that showed some efficacy mainly in the small intestine and key 67 below below 10 percent so there it's an option but only changing the analog i'm not sure so i don't i don't usually do that okay thank you and maybe this question uh question 24 yeah. is for anton julio um, if lipase and amylase readings are within range, should the patient take Creon for better digestion and gaining weight? So, sorry, can I just add something about somatostatin analog? About sure. The, the first question. I, I totally agree with Jaume about the possibility because we have to consider the possibility to use high dose scheduled treatment with somatostatin analog because, because it's an option to, to uh, prolong the time of. Uh, uh, Stabilization with uh, a quite well tolerated um, uh, therapy. So, Madosin and are in general the, 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 the best tolerated treatment. So, if we have the possibility to prolong this time with just only some and analog, it's really a great option. It's, and another uh, possibility, uh, another thing, another aspect to consider is that uh, sometimes it can be useful to continue. To use somatostatin analog in association with another treatment, even after progression, because there are some indirect uh, effect and some uh, impact on uh, quality of life of the patient by using somatostatin analog, uh, for example, by controlling uh, diarrhea in patients with uh, this uh, complication. So, take in mind also this possibility. Sorry, uh, what can you? Yeah. Can can you tell me about the, the, the second question? Yeah, the question is question 24. If lipase and amylase readings are within range, should the patient then take Creon for better digestion and to try to gain weight? Uh, can, can, uh, I didn't understand. Should the patient? So they want to know, um, should they take Creon to help better digest their food and to help try to gain weight when their readings of lipase and amylase are, are within range? No, I didn't understand this question. <laughs> I suppose uh, let, let's just answer the question about the benefit of Creon um, for for digestion oh, and yes, to yes. gain okay, weight. Okay, okay. Yes, sorry, sorry. Yes, Creon. Uh, yes, of course. In, in our in our center, uh, we uh, normally use this drug, uh, so pancreatic enzyme. Uh, in uh, all patient undergone uh, somatostatin analog. So the question was. Uh, about uh, the use of this drug, uh, we uh, generally always use a uh, um, high amount of uh, prion uh, to uh, answer uh, a, a better tolerance because the only problem with somatostatin analog is uh, the possibility of diarrhea and uh, in a minority of patient constipation uh, by using somatostatin analog. So if we have uh, the possibility to use this symptomatic drug, it's, a, it's just a symptomatic drug, and it's, the meaning is to prevent uh, a possible side effect. Uh, I think, and to improve the quality of life, I think it's really, really important to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, I know we're a little bit over time, but a couple more questions if we can. There's one specifically for Jaume, uh, question 21. Uh, Jaume, are you saying that only 20% of patients see a positive response from PRT in small intestinal? location of the primary tumor, does it work better in small tumor rather than bigger tumors? Yes. Uh, so the high tumor burden is usually uh, not related with the better responses. So these are well, no, this is also one of the of the concepts of trying to use these strategies slightly earlier, earlier in the evolution of the disease. For chemotherapy, for instance, 
probably doesn't matter. So it's not as important having more or less disease because you will have probably the same probability to have a response. But for PRD and for even targeted agents, as less as we have, probably the higher probability to have benefit and responses. And, and this is a small intestine based on the, on the phase three study that you have today. So retrospective data is suggesting higher responses uh, for pancreatic, for instance, and, and other locations. But we need to wait the phase three studies to know exactly which is the percentage of responses in these settings. Thanks, Jeremy. Just to tag on one final question, question 29. How long post PRT therapy should you wait for results to be best measured? Wow, this is a very good question. Uh, very good and few clear responses here. So what we have seen is that if everything goes well during the therapy, no clinical and analytic parameters are changing. So we, if we see that the therapy is working, adding an scan in the middle of the, of the four cycles does not add anything. So we did a small uh, prospective study a couple of years ago trying to look at which is the best time to do the gallium-68 uh, PET scan after having the, the four cycles of PRT. So we used one shot of, uh, of the, of the gallium-68 at three months after therapy and another one at six months. So the six-month evaluation is much better than a three month. So we don't need to use that if nothing changes. But if clinically you know, something happens or in the labs, we can see a worsen on the liver function, for instance, then we need to do that, the, the, the workup uh, much earlier, but at least six months after the last uh, PRT dose. Thank you, Jaume, and th thank you, Anton Julio, for a wonderful discussion and great presentations. Um, I think we need to move on to the next part of our agenda now, part three. Um, so I want to introduce Anna Kumariano and Louis de Mestier. Um, uh, who are going to give part three about new treatments and what is coming down the track. So um, please over to you and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for this kind uh, invitation and presentation. Uh, we are very happy to take part into this uh, important day. Uh, I am gastroenterologist from Paris in France in Hôpital Beaujon, and uh, I am very happy to make uh, this lecture together with Dr. Anna Kumarianou, uh, who is a medical ontologist uh, from the Atikon University Hospital in Greece. We are going to talk about the new treatments and what is going coming uh, down the track. We are not going to go deep into details, into technical details of uh, clinical trials, but are going to uh, give you an overview of uh, the main uh, research that are currently uh, going. Next track, Next slide, please. There are still areas of unmet needs in uh, the treatment of neuroendocrine neoplasms. Uh, although its treatment landscape has dramatically evolved over the last decade, and uh, Jaume Anton Julio and uh, the other colleagues have uh, very nicely presented uh, all the uh, therapeutic options that are currently available, there is obviously a permanent need for new treatments and for the improvement of the currently available treatments regarding both efficiency uh, in terms of symptom controls, quality of life, uh, delaying progression, and uh, also uh, regarding tolerance and uh, quality of life. Next, please. Also, there is a, a very a strong need for, for markers and biomarkers predictive of treatment efficacy because we need to uh, always select the most appropriate treatment for the right patient on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis during uh, multidisciplinary team uh, discussions. And for that, we need obviously to define the best treatment sequence and treatment strategy for each patient. Obviously, quality of life is never an option for us to consider uh, regarding uh, the clinical trials and regarding the real life treatment, of course, and we uh, must always consider uh, symptoms, side effects, and cumulative toxicity 
and we must uh, move toward the development uh, of patient-reported outcomes for treatment evaluation. Next slide, please. So what is coming uh, down the tracks uh, with uh, a short time of discussion, we have decided to focus on the novel biomarkers and developments in somatostatin analogs, targeted therapies, PRT and uh, immunotherapy. Next, please. So first, uh, we need novel biomarkers in order to better understand the severity of the disease, the evolution also of the disease, and in order to have some theranostic purpose, which means for selecting the most appropriate candidates for the treatments. Next, please. We have uh, several kinds of biomarkers. There are some of them uh, which are related to the tumor directly, uh, such as histopathologic biomarkers, and uh, here on the, on the figure, you can see a, a pathological slide of a tumor with a protein immunostaining uh, and uh, a lot of uh, biomarkers and tissue biomarkers are under evaluation in order to better select uh, the most appropriate candidates. There are also circulating biomarkers that are currently under development or uh, under validation, uh, which can involve circulating tumor cells, uh, circulating DNA and uh, circulating RNA and microRNA also, including the net test. And uh, last but not least, we uh, are also uh, gaining more and more consideration for tumor genomic profiling uh, in order to uh, find activable uh, mutations. Next, please. Uh, all these tissue biomarkers rely on uh, the uh, biopsy and obtaining some tumor samples. Of course, we also have non-invasive biomarkers uh, regarding imaging, and uh, a lot of them are uh, currently under consideration in order to improve the precision of imaging detection for imaging workup, also for the follow-up of patients, such as here in this example, this is a, a fusion uh, PET scan with a CT scan. Uh, some of them uh, can also be useful for patient selection for treatments. And uh, of course, uh, we have all uh, heard about the selection of uh, patients for PRT based on the uh, gallium PET CT scan. Uh, all these imaging biomarkers must also be used for better measurement of the efficacy of the treatments. Next, please. Now moving towards uh, somatostatin analogs, as nicely uh, highlighted before, these are uh, the most appropriate treatment for first-line anti-secretory intents in patients with uh, functioning neuroendocrine tumors, including carcinoid syndrome, but also uh, some kind, some of the pancreatic functioning neuroendocrine tumors, also for acromegaly. Uh, it's also one of the best uh, choice for the first line treatment with anti-tumor intent for patients with uh, overall good prognostic metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. Next, please. And the first two steps as uh, uh, Jaume and Anton Julio started to discuss it will be to focus on how can we uh, optimize the dose in order to uh, find the best uh, possible efficacy of the somatostatin analogs, either uh, as a, an upfront uh, increased dose or in case of tumor progression, uh, uh, how, how much could we uh, increase the dose of somatostatin analogs? Also, uh, some clinical trials are currently evaluating the best sequence, and notably the use of somatostatin analogs as a maintenance treatment, for example, after chemotherapy, targeted therapy, or PRT. Next, please. One of the uh, most important developments regarding, regarding uh, somatostatin analogs is the development of an, oral, of an oral form that could, in the next future, uh, replace the uh, injectable long-acting release form. Uh, comparisons are uh, currently underway, and we are expecting this uh, oral somatostatin analogs 
to improve quality of life and why not to improve uh, symptom controls. So uh, such clinical trials are uh, currently ongoing and uh, we uh, hope their results in the next future. Next, please. Now regarding uh, targeted therapies, uh, so as uh, previously described, targeted therapies are uh, generally uh, circulating uh, uh, medication within the bloodstream, which uh, is represented here uh, in this uh, schema. Uh, there can also uh, consist in small molecules entering into the tumor cells in order to have some efficacy directly uh, towards some proteins that are important for tumor progression. And uh, as represented here, uh, we know that currently everolimus and sunitinib are uh, the two uh, most important targeted therapies in neuroendocrine tumors because they are validated for the treatment of progressive metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. Next, please. There are other new targeted therapies that are under development. The uh, most advanced one is surufatinib that is already approved in China. And we are awaiting for uh, the results of ongoing clinical trials in Europe and America in order to uh, gain authorization of use of these treatments. Other therapies are under development. Uh, other uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors such as lenvatinib, cabozantinib, uh, but also other uh, inhibitors such as belzutifon in uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Next, please. Uh, also, we are uh, currently uh, running uh, clinical trials in order to optimize the use of targeted therapies, optimize in terms of combinations with other treatments, and also to uh, study the best possible sequence, notably with chemotherapy and PRT. Uh, and finally, I would say that uh, there are currently a lot of efforts and molecular efforts in order to identify new targets that could lead to the development of uh, new targeted therapies. Next, please. Obviously, the future of targeted therapies uh, would lie within an individualized uh, approach, uh, which would rely on uh, tumor and blood sampling in order to uh, perform some exhaustive tumor and constitutive profiling uh, with the aim to identify biomarkers uh, within the proteins, within the DNA and RNA of the tumor. Uh, Within the, uh, the, the, the scope of, of the identification of such biomarkers, the interpretation is always a very uh, long and, and tough analysis uh, with the aim to identify actionable targets, which will hence be discussed within, uh, within multidisciplinary molecular tumor boards in order to decide to propose some individualized uh, target therapies. So such clinical trials uh, exist currently uh, in Europe, in the States, and uh, also in Asia. Uh, and uh, I think that this kind of approach will be very important for the next future in order to move toward uh, individualized uh, targeted therapies. Uh, I'm, next slide, please. I will now uh, leave the room uh, to Dr. Anna Kumarianu. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Louis. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present here uh, with you. I'm going to present to you uh, some uh, new exciting data regarding uh, radiopeptide therapy and uh, immunotherapy. So uh, I will start by saying that, of course, research in the field of neuroendocrine tumors, and more specifically in uh, imaging and uh, somatostatin receptor therapy, uh, is evolving. New tracers are under uh, tests. So one such tracer is copper 64 that deemed to dotate may, uh, may improve imaging pictures in end patients. And this is due to the shorter uh, uh, mean positron range, uh, five times less than that of gallium, and the longer half time. So we may get better pictures uh, with these new tracers. As you can see in this picture on the left side, uh, we can see a lung uh, net uh, patient uh, 
This is a uh, picture from Lang and the middle you can see the heart and at the bottom of each picture you can see thoracic vertebra. And uh, on the top of uh, the picture on the, on the left is a gallium dotted talk. In the middle is a um, copper dotted tape. And as you can see, these are pretty similar, but in the copper uh, dotted tape picture, you can see an additional bone metastasis, which was uh, confirmed by a gallium PET scan five months later. So you can see a better accuracy with uh, this new tracer that is still though under investigation. On the right side of the picture, you can see two PET scans. Again, one with gallium dotted talk on the top and one with the copper uh, PET, PET scan below of the same patient with intestinal neuroendocrine tumors. As you can see from these pictures that show the whole body of the patient on the top, you can see the lungs and the heart in the bottom, you can see the abdomen with the liver and the intestines. Uh, you can see that both tracers indicate metastatic disease in the liver and in the, in the intestinal region, but maybe you can see here that with copper dota tape, we can see some more lesions compared with gallium uh, dota talk. Next slide, please. Next, okay. And we heard from Professor Cap de Villa earlier than how treatment of neuroendocrine tumors with lipesium dota is currently considered as a standard of care, uh, particularly in patients with high expression of somatostatin receptors. And lutetium is a beta emitter particle. Now, new approaches are being developed by using emitters of alpha energy. So these are isotopes such as uh, lead-212, that has the potential to improve both safety and efficacy. And uh, this uh, can happen as alpha emitters have shorter range and more cytotoxic radiation. So they can accumulate more um, tracer in the area of interest and less tracer in the bystander normal cells. So here we can see a very interesting case of a young male patient with multimetastatic disease in the entire body. You can see that there are lymph nodes there are, um, in the lung, there are lymph nodes in the abdomen. You can see multiple liver metastases shown by the red arrow and multiple lymph nodal metastases in the abdomen shown by the uh, other uh, arrow, which is lower down. You see the picture, the patient has uh, received uh, uh, gradually uh, four injections of this new uh, dotam tape PRT. And as you can see here from the picture, there is gradual improvement of uh, the metastatic lesions. And uh, we can see also on the right end of the picture, a 11 month follow-up uh, PET scan that indicates um, a complete response and uh, maintenance of this good result with this new treatment. Uh, next slide, please. Similarly here, we can see another case with the same emitter. This is a young female patient with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and multiple bilateral liver metastases. Regardless of this heavy tumor burden, uh, indicated again by the red arrow, the patient gradually achieved complete response following four injections of therapy that was maintained at three months of follow-up. And you can see this picture on the right uh, of this uh, slide, whereby the liver, uh, which is shown very dark on the left side, becomes uh, uh, clear of metastatic uh, disease, at least uh, with the image. Next slide, please. Now we heard from uh, Professor de Mestier just a few minutes ago that uh, we have some new oral drugs of targeted therapy, and we are excited about it. You can see here uh, two pictures of caposalinin and PARP inhibitors. These novel combinations therapies that are being developed combining radiopeptide therapy that I just showed with these targeted agents are really very exciting protocols. Uh, 
this uh, on the left side, you can see caposatinib that hits cancer cell from the inside, as Professor de Mestier indicated very well, causing interruption of cell proliferation and inhibition of proliferation uh, of uh, blood vessels that uh, has, a, a, as a result, the discontinuation of uh, the feeding of the tumor and also uh, the inhibition of the migration of cells to distant organs. Uh, the cabozatinib has been approved for other cancers, such as kidney cancer and liver cancer, but not yet for neuroendocrine tumors. But as we said earlier, it uh, is currently being uh, exploited as an extra drug for neuroendocrine tumors. Similarly, on the right, you can see another example, which is the PARP inhibitors, the, that are very efficient drugs in causing cell death as seen from other cancers, such as breast and ovarian cancer, which is also already approved. Again, this is another uh, example of a drug that is being investigated. Now, both drugs, as we said, are tested in combination with radiopeptide. And by employing two lethal hits, one from the drug and one from the PRRP, uh, is expected to overcome resistant cells and become therapeutically more efficient. Next slide, please. Finally, I would like to say a few words about immunotherapy. I'm sure that you are all aware about immunotherapy and monoclonal antibodies called checkpoint inhibitors that have been approved for other um, cancers, like mostly uh, in the beginning were uh, not notorious for uh, melanoma and then for lung cancer, but now we see them uh, applied in more and more cancers. And um, it's more important, mortantly, most importantly used in cancers that are overexpress a biomarker called PDL1. And what is PDL1? It's a biomarker that we heard about earlier also by Professor uh, Demestier. Uh, prevent cells uh, of the immune system to recognize cancer cells and attack them. And uh, monoclonal antibodies, what they do is they unmask uh, these cancer cells a little bit like an invisibility cloak, if you remember from Harry Potter's film. So immunotherapy aims to block these molecules and present the cancer cells to the immune system. And this may result in the elimination of cancer cells through immunity. Unfortunately, in neuroendocrine tumors, and although several studies have been carried out with checkpoint inhibitors, um, they, their effect was very, was very slim. So we don't know exactly why immunotherapy is not an effective drug in these tumors. And uh, only very, very few selected patients with neuroendocrine tumors have been um, uh, tested with these drugs and had some positive results. This lack of uh, um, efficacy is most probably due to the different biological characteristics of neuroendocrine tumors. And we, we are currently exploiting uh, these approaches uh, in these uh, neuroendocrine tumors with other also drugs. For example, next slide please. We use, uh, we test uh, CAR T cells, and CAR T cells are immune cells generated in the lab uh, to recognize uh, proteins on the cell surface of uh, neuroendocrine tumors of each patient. For example, one such a, a protein is CDH17. And of course, as we said earlier, we have uh, patients that uh, are currently are in, uh, in clinical trials with this, uh, with this approach. Other approaches include vaccines, such as vaccines targeting Sardervin, which is another uh, pathway that is uh, upregulated in neuroendocrine tumors. Another uh, approach is uh, with oncolytic viruses. And finally, immunotherapy combinations with other drugs, such as checkpoint inhibitors and uh, targeted agents, such as those that I showed in my previous slide. Next slide. You know, as time uh, goes by, more light is shed in the neuroendocrine tumor disease, and uh, we become aware of the multiple dimensions in the biology of this disease. And uh, similar to these nice pictures that uh, depict light, uh, we can uh, evol evolve uh, our understanding for, for, from two dimension to three dimension to four dimension. Um, 
delineating and characterizing better uh, the profile of each patient and therefore uh, become closer to a better uh, therapy and cure. Therefore, further research achievements in molecular medicine technology and better uh, collaboration through multidisciplinary teamwork is expected to transcend current boundaries in personalized therapy. Thank you very much for your uh, attention and listening. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Louis, for a wonderful presentation. Um, so we're going to, I know we're a little bit behind time, but I think there are some questions that are really worth asking. Um, so please, both of you, um, jump in, whoever you think is best to answer this. And uh, also, just to those who are posting questions, some of your questions have been answered through the presentation. Um, and uh, I'll try and get through as many questions uh, as we can with the time. But maybe I start off with... Um, uh, uh, question 34, um, would previous beta article PRT treatment exclude you from participating in an alpha particle PRT treatment in the future? Anna, maybe? Yes, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, if I understand correctly uh, regarding PRT, at the moment we have the standard treatment with lutetium, and I show you some nice uh, cases and pictures of uh, the type of research uh, that is currently going on and uh, there are several more uh, like this uh, happening now, both in Europe and uh, the United States. So we don't know exactly when this will be available, but of course there is very active uh, research. I hope I answered your question. I, I would add that the, the lutetium uh, PRT was a, a fantastic proof of concept of, of PRT in your endocrine tumors. And now, it has opened a, a, a wide field of research regarding alpha emitters, but also other kind of receptors and other targets. Uh, and to to complement the, the the answer of Anna, I would say that uh, clinical trials are are currently beginning. Some of them have already begun, and uh, large uh, phase three trials uh, are going to uh, be conducted uh, in early uh, 2023. Thank you. Okay, so maybe a uh, question um, 33. Um, can we mention a little bit more, more about surufatinib, and is that suitable for pancreatic and or uh, small intestinal net? Well, the, the, the surufatinib has been uh, tested first in, in two large phase three clinical trials in, in China, with uh, one of them being in pancreatic neonocrine tumors and the second one in extra pancreatic, uh, who, uh, which, which included uh, small intestine, but also uh, other primaries. And so the, the objective of the development of this uh, new treatment, new targeted therapies, would be clearly to encompass uh, both kind of origins. Okay, thank you. Um, question 32, could cabozantinib... Sorry, sorry, Anna, please go ahead. If I may say something also. Um, I think sulfatinib is a very interesting molecule. I, unfortunately, this was not accepted by EMA, and, uh, which is the European... Uh, Drug Association and FDA because uh, of the very uh, narrow uh, population uh, um, tested in, in the clinical trials. And because there were no Europeans or American included, this is why we, we didn't have a chance to have it. But uh, at the moment, this clinical trials with European population is finished completing and uh, we will uh, probably have these drugs again uh, as well in, uh, in Europe and the uh, United States. Sorry to interrupt. Hmm. Okay, um, question 32. Uh, could gabozantinib become a treatment option for a grade two small intestinal net? Well, we're, we're still waiting for uh, confirmatory trials. We know that gabozantinib has been already approved in other kinds of cancers. Uh, we had some preliminary results uh, that were very encouraging and uh, so the the answer is yes should it be confirmed should its efficacy be confirmed 
I think that it, it could be really an option within all the scope of, of targeted therapies. And, and as uh, Dr. Anna Kumarian, who mentioned it also, it could be uh, possibly also an option in, in combination with uh, other treatments uh, such as PRT. But but currently, for the moment, it, it remains uh, it remains a, a, a treatment without a, a clear approval in the fields of non-recurrent tumors. Okay, there is a follow-up question to that, a related question, question thirty-six, which is um, you've probably already answered. But um, what drugs, uh, PARP inhibitors, can be used for combination therapy with cabozantinib? Uh, we cannot use a combination of cabozadinib with other targeted agents. Uh, we know from uh, previous studies uh, with, in other tumors that uh, <clears throat> combinations are not a very easy um, trial due to toxicity. So at the moment, um, if I understand correctly the question whether we can combine the two different drugs, we cannot. Okay, thank you. Um, again, just to repeat uh, the answer you've already given, but the question 35 has been is asking about if the new type of PRT with the 212PB dotatate um, is available anywhere in Europe, uh, anywhere or in, particularly in Europe. Unfortunately, as uh, we indicated with Professor Louis de Mestier, uh, these uh, uh, studies we are showing you in this part, the third part of the is meeting uh, are currently under evaluation. They very, they're very promising, but uh, they're not uh, accessible. So uh, if someone is interested in participating in a clinical trial, uh, you can um, contact us and we can uh, direct you, but uh, uh, there are very limited sites uh, uh, around the world that uh, carry out these trials. Yeah, the, the, absolutely, and I, I, I confirm also, and there are, these new PRT agents are currently not available outside of the field of research. Okay, can I ask one more question then? Uh, question 30. Is it normal to continue with somatostatin analogs after PRT treatment? Well, the, this, this question has not been clearly resolved yet. Uh, we have some retrospective data that seems to indicate that the combination of somatostatin analogs with PRT might achieve better outcomes than PRT alone. Uh, we must also not forget that in the pivotal trial, uh, NETO1, who, uh, which, which uh, demonstrated the efficacy of PRT, the, this treatment PRT was in combination with somatostatin analogs. Uh, the, there is currently some kind of direction towards uh, somatostatin analogs maintenance uh, more generally after some other active treatments, and uh, this practice uh, goes in the in the same way. Yeah. All right. Thank you both. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I think a great discussion there. Um, so um, I think we really need to move on to the next section. Um, thank you, Anna. Thank you, uh, Louis. And uh, we move on now to part four, which is um, how uh, patient, patient advocacy groups can help you, the patient. Um, and in this uh, presentation, we have Dirk van Genechten from Belgium and Jackie Herman from Canada. And they are both uh, members of INCA on the board of INCA and also patients. So over to you both. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. We can move to the next slide, please. My name is Jackie Herman, as Mark mentioned. I'm a Canadian neuroendocrine cancer patient. I'm 52 years old. I was diagnosed with small bowel nets in 2008. Um, as Mark mentioned, I'm on the board of INCA and I'm also the current treasurer and I am the volunteer president of CNETS. My name is Dirk van Genechten. I am 63 years old. Uh, I was diagnosed in 2011 with NET. Uh, I'm the vice president of the Belgium NET patient organization and I'm the secretary of INCA. Next slide, please. 
So I say I would say that patient advocacy groups not only help um, the patients, we also endeavor to empower the patients. And we do that in various different ways, typically through providing support to patients. Uh, we offer education programs. We help advocate for access to treatments and diagnostics. And we support uh, research. And we're going to go into each of these areas in the next few slides. Next slide, please. First of all, we care. Uh, living with Nancy's usually means that uh, you have a chronic or a palliative uh, treatment and often with a lesser quality of life. So we listen to our patient and, and we try to help them where possible. We arrange meetings with peers socially. Very important that patients can meet each other and, and discuss their worries and, and their experiences and with healthcare professionals uh, to get uh, more information and especially on a patient level of information. And very, very important is we, we advise our patients to go to for treatment to specialized hospitals or doctors uh, like the ENET Centers of Excellence. Uh, it's, it's actually a no-brainer that a complex disease like uh, NANS, you cannot treat in, in, a, in a hospital which is not really specialized in it. Next slide, please. And uh, no, that's for you, Jackie, sorry. That's okay. So um, we endeavor to provide uh, patients and also caregivers and their families and friends with um, accurate, basic information uh, that's e easy to follow on current technologies and treatments and also new and cutting edge treatments. We do this through uh, information provided on our websites, educational resources such as handbooks, through uh, putting on webinars and in-person conferences in um, the post-COVID era, if we're ever going to get there. Um, and we also make sure that all of these materials and information that we provide patients are vetted by knowledgeable uh, neuroendocrine HCPs. Um, as you are probably aware, research on uh, NENS are gaining, is gaining momentum and often patients have trouble catching up with the pace. So we like to make sure that the information that our organizations provide to patients is delivered in a straightforward and an easily understandable manner. Um, we also provide social networks, as we uh, previously mentioned, um, through virtual and physical um, access, and we allow patients to share their worries and their experiences um, and provide comfort where we can. I think that uh, many of us who are part of these social networks um, find that it is an incredible resource uh, to tap into the uh, experiences of patients and just to learn from each other a great deal. So one of the ways in which Inca has contributed um, to this uh, type of information is Inca provided uh, the uh, net info fact sheets, uh, which are available on the Inca website, which are an incredible resource on the varied types of neuroendocrine cancers. And these were all fully vetted uh, and uh, created in participation with um, neuroendocrine uh, HCPs and also the webinars like the one we're having today. Next slide, please. Go ahead, Dirk. <clears throat> Sorry, we engage. Um, we engage to provide the communication with the healthcare professionals. And, and we, we also try to lower the threshold uh, for the patient. I know everybody knows that all the healthcare professionals have been working very hard with their communication skills, especially to patients, because you had to talk to a, a layman level about very complex diseases. But still, we, we, we notice with our patients that uh, um, they're not always feeling comfortable talking to the professor uh, or, or they don't want to bother them uh, when they have a question. And in advocacy efforts with governments and regulatory bodies and funding entities uh, uh, to improve patient access to existing uh, new treatments and the diagnostics. And we partner with similar uh, like-minded organizations and bodies uh, to address a broader cancer care uh, access issues. And we tap into global advocacy efforts uh, through Inca. Uh, we have uh, now a, a great various deal of uh, nationalities member who are members of Inca and the cooperation is just fantastic. Next slide, please. And we make aware. Um, 
Getting the right diagnosis on NINS is still taking too long. Uh, it's improving, but it's still taking too long. And according to the Inca scan survey, uh, there was a survey done in 2019, the average time for the correct diagnosis is five years. That is too long. And, and it has a negative impact on the survival chances of the patient. So we are reaching out to the GPs and the family doctors and, and also the second line specialists to make them recognize the often vague symptoms on NEN. This brings us to Think NENS. Uh, Think NENS is Inca's next project. Um, it's a, it will be short CME accredited educational movies on various NEN related subject given by specialists. And we predominantly base ourselves uh, to inform the healthcare, the, the GPs and the family doctors. And, and the, I'm, I'm now seven years in, in the board of, uh, no, six years in the board of Inca. Uh, for me, this is the most exciting project we ever done. And, and we can't wait to bring you more news on this somewhere at the beginning of 2023. Next slide, please. So we also uh, participate in promoting things and research would be something that we um, promote heavily. So patient advocacy groups engage in research in various ways. Um, and that is really dependent on the capacity and the experience of the organization. Um, you know, for example, in some countries, um, there are small grants um, that are given to researchers in other countries and other organizations. They are able to develop large um, funding um, uh, organ. Uh, grant programs, which, uh, you know, is excellent. Um, we promote global collaboration on patient surveys, and that's a key way that patient organizations can help inform clinicians and the industry on patient insights and their experiences and challenges, which then goes into, uh, you know, development of resources and treatments and programs for patients. And uh, as I mentioned, many advocacy groups are directly funding net specific research at various levels. So at Inca, there has been the Inca Research Bootcamp. Um, we have participated in the SCAN survey and also the global net patient survey. So in summary, I think I would just like to say that these are some of the ways that uh, patient advocacy groups uh, help and support patients, but there's probably many nuances and different things that we do that we haven't mentioned here. Um, so be sure to reach out to your local uh, patient support or advocacy group uh, for, for, uh, to connect with them in future. And I believe that wraps up our presentation. Thank you, Jackie, and and thank you, Dirk, for a great overview of 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 how patient groups can can help patients on their journey. Um, so, not have many questions from from our our, our viewers. Um, so maybe you I can must ask. Have a, been very clear. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I can ask a question about like a lot of patients often talk about uh, clinical trials and um, you know how do they access them? Do you have any information that you can give to patients about that? Uh, maybe how Inca could help. Do you want to take that, Jackie? Sure. Um, you know, I think that there are some resources out there. Clinicaltrials.gov is particularly um, one of the resources that a lot of patients tap into uh, when looking for clinical trials. But I find here in Canada that a lot of patients come to us and they ask us for help. And so we are the ones who end up doing some of the uh, the research uh, you know, asking around uh, about clinical trials and, and how, you know, patients can access them. Uh, one of the important things is that the patients are talking to their clinicians. I think that is, um, you know, the most important place where they will get information on trials that may be most appropriate for them. Um, but, you know, tapping into the patient organizations and organizations like Inca to direct them to the resources and where they can find information, um, you know, about clinical trials is probably important. There is uh, an incredible initiative underway to make um, accessing, um, you know, clinical trial information more uh, easily digestible for patients. And, uh, and Mark, you're probably in the best position to, to speak to Inca's partnership on, on that initiative. Yeah, well, maybe I could add that what, uh, what we're trying to do through the Inca website is um, we, we're putting up some videos um, where we have asked um, net specialists to give their views and opinions on um, on what important research trials are out there, and um, so look, looking a little bit back in the in the past and looking toward the future of of 
of what 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 clinical trials are there and what might have a real impact or as we can, as we say practice changing um, trials um, and then we're also hopefully working with uh, a an organization to help put a very easy to use clinical trial finder um, in place onto our website and you know that tr that tool is almost available now to the public and hopefully we'll put that on the on the inca website and the real one of the sort of defining characteristics of that is that it does not store information. Your your information is kept uh, to yourself. You don't share it. Um, you can use it without registration, and uh, and it really simplifies how you put information in there to see if you are applicable to a trial. Um, so hopefully we we'll we'll, we'll move that forward within Inca uh, in the next few months. Um, so I would like thank you so much um jackie and dirk and um, we still have some outstanding questions which i would like to ask um so maybe if we can have some of our speakers brought back on uh to the uh to it um so while i'm waiting for that um so uh one of the questions um is uh, question 22, consumers that were initially non-functional become functional over time. Um, do we have maybe Jaime to answer that? Uh, well, they, 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 they really can. So this is something that we should monitor during the evolution of the disease. And I think that we have been discussing that this morning, no? the, the, the indications of new biopsies. So this is something that we always should keep in mind. Can I ask question 26, is there any indications that neuroendocrine cancer can be genetic? And yes, uh, mainly for those that are more, more aggressive. So those that are carcinomas mainly, uh, we need to find different kinds of mutations and sometimes uh, satellite instability, microsatellite instability that may uh, offer you the opportunity to receive immunotherapy, for instance. For those that are better differentiated, less aggressive, we know that the percentage of, of you know, the number of mutations are very low. So it's much more difficult to find uh, a mutation that could be treated there. Uh, that being said, uh, I still believe that knowing more is always better. So if we have the opportunity to do genomic testing, I guess that we should do. Um, I'm just trying out questions that I um, that I see that I want to get covered before we finish up. But question twenty: Is it usual post PRT therapy to see a spike in carcinoid crisis episodes? This is also for me. Yes, please, John. <laughs> uh, well, it it has been described. So everything that can destroy some number of tumor cells. Uh, we can see you know, a worsen of the hormone-related syndrome. And this is not only for carcinoid crisis, but also for other functioning pancreatic nets that we, sh we should always uh, pay attention on the... It's not a, it's like, like the immunotherapy and the cytokine release syndromes, but here it's for hormone release syndromes, and we should that uh, pay attention that it's not only with PRT. Uh, we can see that for... For instance, in 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 local liver therapies that can destroy very quickly uh, a, a huge amount of cells, and then the hormones go out, and and we can have these kind of problems. Okay, the last question, question sixteen: Does an already metastasized primary tumor continue to produce new metastases during treatment with the likes of of uh, somatostatin analog? The primary tumor. Yes. So, well, uh, we also know here that the primaries are usually, how to say that, less, less aggressive no, than the metastasis. So uh, we know that it's uh, frequently seen that the KIA67 increases in, in metastatic sites compared to the primaries. But this is not related with the... the, the, the the probability of having new metastasis. So, if the question goes, uh, if it's the, if the question is related with, if we need to remove the primary tumor 
when we have distant metastases, it depends, probably not on the pancreas and sometimes in the in the small intestine. But uh, having new metastases, you know, this is a systemic disease, so it can appear from everywhere. Thank you, Jaume, and, and thank you to uh, Jackie and Dirk for a great presentation and for allowing me to ask some extra questions, which are more clinical. Um, so I think we've reached the, the end of the um, of our webinar. Um, we want to move into the into the closing now uh, and uh, invite Eva back with us. Um, so I want to uh, to to thank all the speakers. Um, uh, Really reviewing what we had uh, to today um, was a wonderful presentation. Some great, uh, great talks by by our fantastic speakers. I want to thank them for for putting the, their time into into making this uh, available to us as patients. And um, we heard at the beginning about the the terminology such as grading and stages and the different types of treatments of of the, the, the like SSA and PRT and CGA and what those things mean and it helps us a lot as patients to to get an understanding of of, of these terminologies so we're not at sea when we're talking to our clinicians uh, and as we, we reflect on the on the treatments that we we have we're having or about to have. Um, and then we we saw some great information about the, the the different types of treatments and diagnostics that are there, um, and how patients are selected for for um, those treatments, um, and why they are given. Uh, we saw some information about uh, what's coming down the tracks and how great the, uh, the 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 amount of work that's going on in this field. Um, it's very encouraging to us as patients to know. That so much, so much research is going on in in both new types of treatments and in combination therapies and uh, and in diagnostics that are less harmful and less toxic to us, um, uh, and it's it's truly encouraging for the, for the future going forward. Um, we we heard about quality of life and how that is is brought into uh, the the decision making for for our treatments and and it's great to to. I know that's not all about the clinical decision, but about the, the patient themselves. And they should be at the, at the center of, of making decisions on what happens with the, in, their, in their treatments. And uh, delighted to hear that being discussed. Um, and then we finished up with, with um, patient advocacy groups and support groups and how they help um, patients. And, you know, as a patient myself, I'm having been diagnosed with a, a rare disease that I knew nothing about and had never heard of. It was so enlightening to to then go into a room full of of fellow patients and hear their stories and 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 it, it really gives great encouragement and 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 positivity towards the future um, and that's what patient support and advocacy groups do as well as pushing the agenda and raising awareness about this disease so that we can reduce the the time to diagnosis which obviously helps our, our, prog our prognosis. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Ava. Um, to do the final wrap up and thank you so much everybody for being part of today. Thank you so much Mark and I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to all the speakers. Uh, maybe you can have next slide to all the speakers uh, for for participating and sharing your vast knowledge uh, in this uh, area of rare diseases. Uh, I think it's uh, been a very good discussion also during the afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the Inca office, Mark and Theodora, for, for making this happening. And of course, the Ines office with Leah, Ulrike, Olivetta, who have um, been supporting us in setting all of this up. Uh, and Marcus Lele and Simon Hersman for their technical assistance, uh, making this possible for us. Uh, and furthermore, I would like to to extend my gratitude to the Enet Education Group that has helped up in setting up this event. Uh, and uh, finally, of course, to all the participants listening to this um, uh, great webinar. I think uh, uh, it has been very valuable and I hope that you have got some information that can be of help for you in your future uh, life. So just to remind you all to complete the participation survey, uh, we really want to know what you think. And uh, for further information, you can visit the Inca homepage or the ENETS homepage as well to find um, uh, more information about uh, events and, and um, publications and so on. And the next slide. 
And this is just uh, showing where we have the centers of excellence. Uh, you know that our centers of excellence program was established in 2009. And we now have 65 centers of excellence, the ma vast majority, of course, in Europe, but also uh, a couple of uh, centers in Australia and in the US. And you can scan the QR code on this homepage to on this page to locate the INET Center of Excellence near you if you wish to get in contact with people there. And the next slide. Uh, I also would like to say a big thank you to our sponsors. Uh, AAA and Ibsen that made this possible for us. Um, we are very grateful for their unrestricted dedication grant that supports this event. And uh, the final slide, a big, big thank you to all of you for participating in this Enets and Inca Net uh, Cancer Day Educational Webinar. It's been a great pleasure to have all the speakers and all your listeners with us today. So uh, a big thank you. And uh, with that, I say goodbye and hope you have a nice day. Thank you.